So let's begin specifically talking about scalability. How do you design systems that can handle millions of people hitting it all at once? You know, at Amazon, when I was there, it was routine for a service to have to handle tens of thousands of transactions per second. I'm sure it's gotten even worse since I've left, but modern techniques allow you to horizontally scale these systems such that they can actually handle that traffic. And if you get more traffic, you just throw more servers at it. So let's see how that works exactly. Let's start by talking about a single server design. So we're going to start with a, a design that does not scale, and we're going to work our way up to one that does. So in a sort of legacy single server design, you have a bunch of clients out there on the internet, right? People running their phones or laptops or PCs, whatever they might be, and they are coming through the internet, which is what this cloud represents, and they talk to one box on the other side. So my personal website, for example, is set up this way. It doesn't get a whole lot of traffic, and I don't really care too much if it goes down for a while, so hey, one server's enough for that, you know, for my personal thing where I like keep my hobbies. No big deal. I make sure the, you know, data's backed up somewhere so I can restore it if I need to, but it just doesn't get enough traffic um, for me to care about it that much, and I don't really care if it goes down for a length of time either. That's really the only situation where you'd want to deal with a single server design, but sometimes that is the right solution. You know, maybe there's some little intranet tool that just isn't that important and you don't have a lot of budget for and you don't want to spend a lot of time maintaining it. So it still has its place, you know? That's just running HTTP of some sort. And, you know, maybe there's WordPress or something on top of that. I don't know. But the protocol is HTTP, generally speaking, talking to the web. And there's probably some database as well. Uh, again, for a really small website, maybe that database resides on that server itself. Again, that's how my personal web server runs. You know, that's just uh, serving stuff about my hobbies. Why, why spend more money on it than that? It just has a little MySQL instance running on there in the same server as my Apache instance, and it's all on WordPress or whatever. Doesn't matter. But of course, if you're going to be doing this for a real commercial system, this is a terrible idea, right? I mean, that host is a single point of failure. So if that box goes down, uh, I'm going to have a really bad day if I care about what that box was doing, right? I'm going to have to go and provision a new server. I'm going to have to restore everything on it from a backup, and I'll probably have to go switch, you know, the DNS entries somewhere to point to that new server so that people can actually hit it. And, you know, this does happen to me pretty often with my personal site. It's kind of a pain. Uh, and if this was happening on a real commercial system where I'm getting paged about it at two in the morning, I would not want to deal with that. So generally speaking, unless you're specifically being asked to develop something that is unimportant in small scale, which is pretty unlikely in a system design interview, this is not the approach you want to take. So how can we make this better? Well, one thing we can do is to separate out the database at least. So, you know, again, let's start at the top here. We have all the clients in the world out there that want to hit your system and they're connecting to you through the internet somehow. They're being routed from all over the globe to someplace. And again, in this case, we'll just have a single HTTP server, but we're going to at least split out the database part of this, right? Well, you know, that's a little bit better. So at least now, um, I'm not going to lose my web server and data and my pages and the database itself all at the same time. Uh, they're, they're actually scaled independently. So that's a little bit better from a resiliency standpoint. Not, not much though, right? Uh, but the real benefit of this is that I can scale these two things independently. So let's say I have an application that's really hitting the database hard. Um, that might be eating up a lot of CPU time on my web server where I'm spending more time in my database processes than in my HTTP processes, right? Maybe MySQL is eating up all of my resources and not leaving enough resources for the web to actually um, serve enough connections. So kind of the next step up for scaling up a system like that where you have one server is to at least scale out the database. And now I have two uh, computers out there instead of one that I can spread resources around and I can scale those independently, right? So I can choose a beefier box for the database if I have a really data intensive application that's doing complicated joins or whatever it is and maybe something less powerful for the front end web server if that's appropriate. So that gives me a little more control over how I scale these things, which is good. But still, these are both single points of failures now, right? So if my database goes down, my website goes down. If my web server goes down, my website goes down. So from a resiliency standpoint, not really any better. So let's talk about one way of scaling up further. Let's say that, you know, I do want to take more traffic than I could have handled on that one server originally. Again, we start with our clients connecting through the internet and maybe I just throw a bigger server at it. This is what we call vertical scaling. So vertical scaling means that instead of adding more servers, I just add a bigger server and that can get you to a certain point, right? 
for a long time with databases, that's kind of what we did. You know, you started off with an Oracle instance running somewhere, and as you threw more and more traffic at it and more and more data at it, the way to make it scale was to just get a bigger and more expensive database host. And these things got really, really expensive really, really quickly. Same thing applies to your web server here. So I have a big fat uh, host here running HTTP D, uh, presumably. And maybe instead of a little virtual machine running on one CPU, I'm running a whole machine here now or something, or you know, at least a bigger virtual machine, right? So to some extent, you can just throw more hardware at the problem and get away with that for a little while. So if I have a little personal website that again, I don't care too much about, and it suddenly gets a surge of traffic, maybe I deal with that by just throwing a, a bigger virtual machine at it. And in fact, that's what I'm doing right now. Um, I've had some websites of my own that uh, kind of buckled under the pressure of crawlers hitting them in particular. And by just throwing a, a bigger virtual machine at it, it solved that problem. But again, not something you generally want to be doing in production because vertical scaling has its limits. You can only get so big of a computer before you can't get anything bigger. You know, there's only so many CPUs you can get in a system. There's only so much memory. At some point, you're going to hit a wall. So vertical scaling only gets you so far, but you need to know what it is. Similarly, I can make the database server bigger too. You know, we talked about that a little bit in the context of like a giant Oracle database. Um, same idea, you know, maybe I need more storage, maybe I need uh, more CPU power for processing those queries. To a point, I can just throw bigger and bigger and more powerful machines at my database server and scale to an extent just that way. So I haven't actually, the only good thing about this is that there's not a lot of things to maintain, right? So in this system, I still only have two hosts to take care of. So that's kind of a plus, right? Um, the fewer uh, computers that I have, the fewer servers that I have, the fewer things that are likely to break in any given day, okay? But when it does break, I'm in trouble, right? Either of those things goes down, my website's down, and it's gonna stay down until I can replace that host with something else, right? Maybe that's okay, probably isn't though. So again, just to summarize there, servers only come so large, that is the problem. So you still have single points of failure here. The only upside of this is that you have fewer servers to maintain. Now, horizontal scaling, this is kind of where it's at. So it's a pretty safe bet for, that for most modern system design problems where you're being asked to develop a system at large scale, they want you to take a more horizontal scaling approach. So again, you, you have your clients out there in the world hitting you through the internet. The idea here is that instead of a single server, you have multiple servers and you have some sort of a load balancer between the internet and those servers that are distributing that load in some fair, even manner. There, are, We could talk about load balancer strategies. You know, there's round robin, there's partitioning it. Um, there's, you know, load balancers that can actually look at the available capacity on a server and try to route uh, traffic intelligently that way. So that's a whole, whole other can of worms. But the idea is that there is some either device or software process running somewhere that is distributing that load coming in from the internet to a whole fleet of servers. So the beauty of that is that if one of those goes down, assuming I have enough access capacity provisioned, uh, the user doesn't need to know. The load balancer can realize that a host is down and reroute the traffic around it automatically so that you have no downtime. Pretty cool, right? Maybe they all still point to a single database. Um, you know, we could scale that out as well if we wanted to. Uh, but in this case, you know, maybe our database isn't really a, a choke point um, and we have good redundancy on it somehow. We'll get more into database scaling later on. But at least in this architecture, our front end web servers are going to keep on serving, right? Maybe they have some sort of a cache in front of the database so they can still do something meaningful if that database were to go down. But the idea of horizontal scaling is that as I get more and more traffic, I just add more and more servers to the fleet and a load balancer will distribute that traffic amongst those servers. So you can see you can pretty much scale infinitely with this idea, right? If I have, you know, millions of transactions coming in, throw in enough servers in there and you'll be good. There are some finer points about, you know, where these are located geographically and what servers, what data centers, we'll get into that. But this is the basic idea of horizontal scaling. It allows an infinite, well, practically infinite way of scaling things up where the more servers you can throw in there, the more traffic you can handle. There's really no bound to it in this case. The downside, of course, is that there's more stuff to maintain. So let's talk about stateful and stateless stuff here. So the, the catch here is that this really only works well if your web servers are what we call stateless. What I mean by that is that subsequent requests should not depend on something being stored on that server from a previous request, okay? 
Now you can store stuff in the database, that's fine. But the servers themselves, those web servers need to be stateless because I don't know where that previous request got routed to. So I cannot assume on any given server that I have any information about the previous hits uh, from that given user, right? So a stateless web server means that any web server can handle any request at any time, okay? Again, it's okay to use the database to tie those together and have sort of a history, but any individual server cannot assume that that server uh, is the one that actually served previous requests to a given user. That's what we mean by stateless. It just means that we're, we're baking in the assumption that any request for a user could have gone to any server, and we cannot assume that our server knows anything about those previous requests directly. Okay. So how do you go about choosing one of those architectures? Well, in general, a theme in this course that I'm gonna be preaching is simplicity. You should always choose the simplest architecture that meets your projected requirements, but no simpler than that. So yeah, if, I mean, if you're being asked to develop something on the internet, uh, where it's just like a little phone tool maybe for one team, there's probably not a whole lot of point in over-engineering that and building some huge horizontally scalable system, right? Maybe a simpler one is okay. Maybe vertical scaling is okay in that instance. But the truth is for most of these system design interviews at the big companies, that's not the sort of thing they're gonna ask you to design. They're gonna ask you to design YouTube or design Google or design some massive system where you need to have that scalability. So usually it's a safe bet that you wanna go with a more horizontally scaled, horizontally partitioned uh, architecture there instead. So let's dive into that in more depth uh, in our next section here. But big takeaway here, vertical scaling just means that you're throwing bigger machines at the problem. Horizontal scaling means you're throwing more machines at the problem and distributing the load throughout those different machines. Okay, that's the, the main thing to take away from this lecture.